Alex Ribal was a 16-year-old student at Franklin Regional High School in Murraysville, Pennsylvania, who carried out a mass stabbing attack on April 9th. A mass stabbing? Bro's not even a school shooter, he's a school stabber. What happened to school shooters in prison? When Nicholas Cruz got his sentence for a school shooting, he never would have imagined the horrors he would face in prison. You know what's crazy? I know the video just started and I just paused it. One of my homies was in that school shooting. I remember he literally called me during it and he was like, yo, bro, I'm not gonna lie. I think I'm in a school shooting, but like they're saying it's fireworks. And at the time I was like, man, this kid is just, kid. cause it's on Valentine's Day. Who the hell shoot up a school on Valentine's Day, bro? Like, like, like Let's be real, bro. But nah, he was not lying, bro. I searched up on my phone and then it was just like all over the news, like, do not go to Parkland area. School shooting active. I'm like, ain't no way this bro's in a school shooting. Perhaps he thought serving time would be a vacation and not a mental and physical battle. Chad Padilla, another notorious school shooter, was found dead under mysterious circumstances, possibly murder. Others, like Scott Pennington and TJ Lane, continue the violence in prison. The physical and psychological anguish school shooters face in prison is so terrible that many of them choose instead of serving out time. Oh, Let's no. dive into some of the worst experiences for school shooters who got arrested. Scott Pennington. Scott Pennington, a 17-year-old senior. Bro, this dude is not 17, bro. Yo, he's already going bald, gang. Yo, y'all, yo, type ones in the chat. Y'all think he really 17? Does that look like 17 to you, bro? <laughs> that, that guy's a super duper senior, bro. Pennington, a 17 year old senior at East Central High School in Hurley, Mississippi, carried out a devastating shooting on January 11th, 1995. He killed two students and wounded seven others mm. using a 38 caliber revolver. Pennington's. Yeah. Bro was using that Abraham Lincoln. He killed two students and wounded seven others using a 38 caliber revolver. Pennington's trial was highly emotional and intense, with the families of the victims demanding justice. He was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without parole. Scott Pennington's life behind bars has been a never-ending struggle for survival. He was taken to the Kentucky State Penitentiary in Eddyville. Before long, he became a target for violence and harassment from fellow inmates, but he isn't the kind of person to back down from a fight. In 2014, Pennington's situation took a turn for the worse. He was involved in a violent altercation with a contract food service employee at the prison, resulting in his placement in isolation. The isolation unit, meant to protect him from other inmates, became a source of psychological torment. He spent 23 hours a day in a small cell. The isolation took a devastating toll on Pennington's mental health. He began experiencing hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, and contemplated suicide multiple times. Solitary confinement is common for school shooters, as you will see in our next entry. Nah, I heard that solitary confinement is horrible, man. It only makes sense, though. Like, imagine just being in a room, you know what I'm saying? No nothing, no, like, you, no human interaction, you're just by yourself. Like, that would drive you crazy. Chad Padilla. Chad Padilla, a 16-year-old student at Italy High School in Italy, Texas, carried out a shocking shooting on January 22, 2018. He opened fire in the school cafeteria, shooting one student six times. The injured student no. survived, but the emotional scars left by the incident would take much longer to heal. Padilla was sentenced to prison, where he faced the consequences of his actions. Chad Padilla's life in prison was marked by violence, uncertainty, and tragedy. As a school shooter, he was a target for aggression and hostility. From fellow inmates. He faced numerous threats and attacks, making his existence behind bars a daily struggle for survival. Despite the measures put in place to keep him safe, Padilla continued to face harassment and intimidation from other inmates. He was subjected to verbal abuse, physical threats, and even assaults. The constant stress and fear took a toll on his mental health, and he struggled with anxiety, depression, and PTSD. One day, he was found dead in his prison cell under circumstances that remain mysterious and controversial. The exact cause of death remains unknown, sparking ongoing speculation and investigation. Our next entry did not show remorse and would continue to act violent in prison. Luke Woodham Luke Woodham's rampage at Pearl High School in 1997 rampage. was an unpredictable incident. On that fateful day, Woodham, then 16, killed his mother, Mary, by bludgeoning her at their home before heading to school with a rifle. He opened fire in the hallway, killing two students, Kentrell McRae and Lydia Dew, and wounding seven others. Luke Woodham's life in prison has been hard. He is currently serving his sentence at the Mississippi State Penitentiary, also known as Parchman Farm. In 2000, Woodham was assaulted by another inmate, resulting in injuries to his face and head. 
head. This incident led to his transfer to a solitary confinement unit. Woodham's time in solitary confinement has been marked by psychological struggles. He has also experienced physical health problems, including chronic pain and digestive issues. Despite his isolation, Woodham has been able to pursue his education, earning a GED and taking college courses through a correspondence program. He has also received counseling and therapy to address his mental health issues. In 2019, Woodham's lawyers filed a lawsuit against the Mississippi Department of Corrections, alleging that his prolonged solitary confinement constituted cruel and Damn. unusual punishment. The he said cruel and unusual punishment. I'm pretty sure those kids that day that he shot was thinking the same thing. Like, yo, I'm here at school. I don't even want to be here. And then the second I look up, I'm just getting bullets fired. Bro, I'd be so mad. What do you even be? You couldn't even be mad, though, because you're dead. The lawsuit was settled out of court, with Woodham being transferred to the South Mississippi Correctional Institute. His story is unsettling, but pales in comparison to that of a next 12-year-old school shooter. Nicholas. Did he just say 12-year-old school shooter? Nicholas Cruz. He's not 12 years old, though. I think he's capping, bro. Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Cruz, born on September 24, 1998, is one of the most notorious school shooters in recent history. On February 14, 2018, he perpetrated the devastating massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, killing 17 people and injuring 17 others. In 2022, Cruz was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Cruz's journey through the criminal justice system has been a tumultuous one. Since his transfer to a maximum security facility, Cruz's life has become even even more isolated. He spends most of his time in solitary confinement, with only one hour daily for exercise and limited interaction with other prisoners. Prior to the shooting, Cruz had behavioral issues and was a member of the Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps and the school's Varsity Air Rifle Team. He was a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the very place where he would eventually carry out the tragic attack. Cruz's mental health has been a significant concern throughout his incarceration. He struggled with depression, anxiety, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which have been exacerbated by his isolation and the constant threat of violence. He's been placed on suicide watch multiple times and his struggles continue to this day. I was gonna say that like it's crazy because half of these people that be talking like oh my god they had such a cruel and unusual punishment like why are they in prison like why are they in bro these men's kids. Charles Andy Williams. Andy Williams, a 15-year-old student at Santana High School in Santee, California, carried out a devastating school shooting on March 5th, 2001. Williams, who was reportedly tired of being bullied, killed two students, Red Brian Cap Zucker and Randy w. Gordon, and injured 13 others. In the weeks leading up to the shooting, Williams had attempted to seek help from a school counselor, but was told to return to class due to a full office. He told a school security guard that he was going to bring a gun to campus, but these claims have not been substantiated by evidence. On the day of the shooting, Williams brought an H shot 22 caliber Arminius HW7 revolver to school and began firing in the hallway and courtyard. The shooting lasted approximately 15 minutes, with Williams firing multiple shots before being subdued by a school security guard. Williams was arrested and later sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. According to reports, Williams has been serving his sentence at the Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California. While in prison, Williams has been involved in several altercations with other inmates and has spent time in solitary confinement. He was denied parole in 2006 and 2019 and was involved in a fight with another inmate in 2011. Williams' family was part of the problem, much like our next school shooter, Robert Gladden. Robert Gladden Jr. was a student at Perry Hall High School in Baltimore County, Maryland, who carried out a shooting on the first day of school in 2012. First on day? August 27, 2012, Gladden, then 15 years old, brought a shotgun to school and shot and wounded a classmate, Daniel Borowie, in the cafeteria. Borowie, a 17-year-old special education student, was critically injured but survived. Gladden was arrested and charged with attempted murder and other related offenses. In 2013, he pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 35 years in prison with all but 20 years suspended. This meant that Gladden would serve at least 20 years in prison with the possibility of parole. Gladden's life in prison is highly structured and monitored with a focus on rehabilitation and preparing him for eventual release. He has been behind bars since 2012 when he was just 15 years old. He has received psychological treatment and counseling to address his mental health issues, including depression and anxiety. He has also participated in educational programs, vocational training and counseling 
counseling sessions to address his behavioral issues and prepare him for re-entry into society. However, his privileges are limited, including restricted access to recreational activities, phone calls, and visitation. He has spent periods in solitary confinement as punishment for disciplinary infractions. I was gonna say, like, what was dude's reasoning for even shooting up a school in the first place? Like, I don't even think he even mentioned that. He was just like, you know, he just came to school one day and just shot a special ed kid. I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, what, what was the point, man? TJ Lane. <clears throat> TJ Lane's rampage at Chardon High School lasted just over a minute, but its impact will be felt forever. On that fateful day, Lane, then 17, pulled out a 22 caliber get pistol and fired 10 shots, striking six students. Three of them, Daniel Parmator, Russell King, and Demetrius Hewlin, died shortly thereafter. Lane's motives remain unclear, but his actions were undoubtedly devastating. The victims, families, and the community at large struggled to come to terms with the senseless violence. Lane's trial was a highly emotional affair, with the victims' families demanding justice. Lane showed little remorse, wearing a t-shirt with the word killer Damn. emblazoned on it to his sentence. Yo, all the people's victims that he just, and he just has killer on it. I'm pretty sure I heard about this kid, yo. He just doesn't give a freak, bro. Like he doesn't care at all, bro. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Behind bars, Lane became a notorious figure with many inmates viewing him with fear. He was initially housed at the Allen Correctional Institution but was transferred to the Ohio State Penitentiary after a failed escape attempt in 2014. Lane's life in solitary confinement is a far cry from the chaos he unleashed that day. While some oh, might see this as a fit punishment, others argue that it's a necessary measure to ensure the safety of both Lane and his fellow inmates. While TJTJ rots in solitary, our next entry managed to secure a GED while serving life. Kipland Kinkle on May 20th, 1998, a tragedy shook the small town of Springfield, Oregon. Kipland Kip Philip Kinkle, a 15-year-old freshman at Thurston High School, carried out a devastating massacre that would leave a lasting impact on the community. The events leading up to the massacre began when Kinkle was suspended from school after being found with a stolen handgun in his locker. Did you find a stolen gun in someone's locker? Like, do they just go through it, or did someone was like... Or was he like trying to be those like that one cool kid in school that's just like, yo, bro, look what I have in my locker, bro. And then he shows a kid and the kid's like, oh my God, you're so cool. And then the kid tells the teacher and then the teacher searches his locker. Is that how that went? Because I'd be thinking like, yo, there's no way they could have been like, yo, we're searching this kid's locker today. Unless someone snitched, you know? His parents, William and Faith, Faith Kinkle, were notified and his father took him home, warning him that he would be sent to military school if his behavior didn't improve. Later that day, Kinkle shot and killed his parents at their home. The next day, Kinkle arrived at school armed with a semi-automatic rifle and two handguns. In the cafeteria, he opened fire on his classmates, killing two students, Ben Walker and Mikhail Nikolazen, and injuring 25 others. He was eventually subdued by fellow students and arrested. Kinkel was sentenced to 111 years in prison without parole. Kip Kinkle, now 39, has spent the last 22 years trapped behind the cold walls of the Oregon State Correctional Institution in Salem. His life has been a never-ending cycle of solitude, confined to a tiny cell for 23 out of 24 hours a day. If you think this story is heartbreaking, wait till you see all the other names on our list. Michael Carniel. On December 1st, 1997, 14-year-old Michael Carneal opened fire on a group of students at Heath High School in West Paducah, Kentucky, killing three and injuring five. Carneal was arrested and brought to trial, where he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Michael Carneal's life in prison has been a never-ending struggle for survival. As a child killer and school shooter, he's been a target for violence and abuse from fellow inmates. He's faced relentless physical assaults, beatings, and threats. The psychological torment has been equally unending, with constant harassment and intimidation. The prison environment is harsh and word gets around quickly. He has spent years in solitary It's crazy because he's complaining like, oh my god this is, um, isn't that like what prison is? Just constant harassment and torment? I mean, I don't know. I've never been to prison. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's chilling there, you know what I'm saying? Maybe if you find the right group of people you can be chill, chilling with the homies you know what I'm saying? But I don't know from what I've been seeing, bro, from what I heard isn't prison like just naturally just like torment? So like what's so surprising about that? confinement, isolated from the general population for his own safety. But even that hasn't been a refuge. He's faced constant noise, darkness, claustrophobia, with limited access to basic amenities. The isolation has taken a toll on his mental health, with reports of depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. After serving 25 years, Carniel requested parole, citing the violence and abuse he suffered in prison. The parole board denied his request, and Carniel was returned to prison to continue serving his life sentence. The only thing he has going for him is the fact that he is still alive. Most shooters killed themselves. Wow. Alex Freebal. 
Alex Ribal was a 16-year-old student at Franklin Regional High School in Murraysville, Pennsylvania, who carried out a mass stabbing attack on April 9th, 2000. A mass stabbing? Bro's not even a school shooter. He's a school stabber. A school stabber. Yo, that's the kind of insane, man. How do you even get away with that? Like, can you just run away from that realistically? Or I, maybe I'm bugging, bro. I feel like I'm just chatting at this point. 2014. Armed with a pair of eight-inch kitchen knives, Rybal stabbed and slashed 20 students and a security what? guard, leaving four students with life-threatening injuries. Fortunately, all the victims survived. Ribble was arrested and charged with attempted homicide, aggravated assault, and other related offenses. In 2017, he pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 23.5 to 60 years in prison. His life is a far cry from the freedom and possibilities he once knew. Behind bars, Freibel's days are filled with the reality of his actions. He is surrounded by the cold walls of his cell, a constant reminder of the harm he inflicted on his classmates. Despite the gravity of his crime, Freibel is receiving the help he needs to address the underlying issues that led him down this path. He is engaged in regular counseling sessions and therapy groups, working to confront his depression, anxiety, and personality disorders. But rehabilitation comes with a price. Freibel's privileges are limited, and his every move is closely supervised by corrections officers. As as the years pass, Ribal will have ample time to reflect on his actions and the lives 100%. he forever changed. Um, I was gonna say, like, how did he stab 20 people? Like, this man hurt more people than an actual school shooter, like the school stabber? What? I mean, I don't think he actually killed him, though. I think it was just injuries. But, like, nah, that's crazy, bro. If you ask me, bro. Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof's name is forever linked to a tragic event in American history. On June 17, 2015, Roof, a 21-year-old white supremacist, opened fire at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, killing nine African-American parishioners, including senior pastor Clementa C. Pinckney. Roof was apprehended and faced legal consequences, including a highly publicized trial where he showed no remorse and was sentenced to death. Had he not received the death sentence, Roof would have faced in life chat. in prison without parole, so where he knows? would have been isolated and vulnerable to hostility from inmates. He is currently serving time in ADX Florence, where he spends his days in solitary confinement, isolated from the world he once sought to divide. His cell, a small, sterile space, is his home for 23 hours a day. The only exceptions are brief moments of supervised solitary. recreation and limited visitation from approved individuals. The maximum security wing is his permanent residence, a place where the most dangerous and high-profile inmates are housed. Here, Roof is cut off from the outside world, with no access to the internet, phone calls, Calls or even books. Regular psychological evaluations are a constant reminder that his actions have consequences, that his ideology of hate will not be tolerated. Even his limited recreational time is supervised, a precaution against any potential violence or radicalization. Damn. Mitchell Johnson me, and Andrew Golden. On March 24, 1998, Mitchell Johnson, 13, and Andrew Golden, 11, perpetrated the devastating Westside Middle School shooting in Jonesboro, Arkansas. The two boys, who were reportedly motivated by a desire for notoriety, pulled a fire alarm and then opened fire on students and teachers as they evacuated the building. The tragic attack resulted in the deaths of four students and one teacher, with ten others injured. The young ages of the perpetrators and the premeditated nature of their crimes were shocking. The boys were arrested and held in juvenile detention facilities, where they awaited trial. Given their ages, Johnson and Golden were tried as juveniles, and the court handed down the maximum sentence allowed under Arkansas law at the time, confinement, until they turned 21. Mitchell Johnson was released from the Arkansas Juvenile Assessment and Treatment Center in August 2005, while Andrew Golden was released in May 2007. Upon their release, both boys were placed on supervised probation and were prohibited from contacting the victims' families or each other. However, Johnson's life after release was marked by further legal troubles. In January 2007, he was arrested for possession of a firearm and marijuana, leading to a four-year sentence in federal prison. Additional charges for theft and possession of a controlled substance in 2008 resulted in further incarceration. Jalen Freiburg on October 24, 2014, Jalen Freiberg, a 15-year-old freshman at Marysville Pilchuck High School in Washington, carried out a devastating shooting in the school cafeteria. Jalen had planned the attack in advance, inviting his friends to lunch before pulling out a Beretta handgun and opening fire. He shot seven students, killing four, Zoe Galasso, Gia Soriano, Shaley, Chuckle Naskett, and Andrew Freiberg, his cousin. Three others were wounded, Karen Parks, his cousin, Nate Hatch, and Carmen Reyes. As police responded to the scene, Jalen took 
his own life with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The victims included two of his cousins, Andrew Freiberg and Karen Parks, who were among those killed. Ke his own cousin? Why are you killing your own cousins, bro? Yo, y'all can tell me right now, does she look like she's like she's hating on bro? Like, usually when there's a school shooter, you know what I'm saying? They usually go for the bullies. They're like, man, I hate this school. And and obviously, they always do some randoms, too. But does she look like she was bullying, bro? Like, I doubt she was, like, anything to do with it. I'm pretty sure this is also his cousin. I don't know, bro. People are just messed up sometimes, man. Karen had tried to intervene, attempting to calm Jalen down oh. before he began shooting. In the aftermath of the tragedy, authorities invest- Damn, she was trying to help him. She was trying to calm bro down, and then he still blitzed her. That's crazy. ...stated how Jalen Freiberg had obtained the weapon used in the shooting. The investigation led to the arrest and conviction of Jalen's father, Raymond Freiberg, in 2015. Raymond was found guilty of illegally purchasing and possessing the gun used in the shooting, as well as additional firearm-related offenses. He learned a hard lesson, unlike our next shooter, who continued his violence even in prison. Jose Reyes. Jose Reyes, a 12-year-old 7th grader, opened fire at Sparks Middle School in Nevada on October- What? Did y'all just hear him? A 12-year-old 7th grader? Middle school, bruh? Oh, November 21st, 2013, he shot and killed a teacher, Michael Lansbury, and injured two students before taking his own life. Reyes used a semi-automatic handgun he had taken from his parents' home. He initially shot a student in the shoulder, then killed Lansbury, who was trying to intervene. He then shot another student in the abdomen before turning the gun on himself. The shooting lasted only a few minutes, and Reyes fired six shots in total. After learning about the shooting at Sparks Middle School, Liliana Reyes, his mother, noticed that the cereal boxes in the kitchen cupboard had been moved suggesting that her son had accessed the family's guns. She called her husband to alert him to the situation. Later, police found two notes written by Jose in a spiral notebook inside his backpack that provided some insight into his motives. The incident was one of the first school shootings in the United States involving a student as young as 12. Had he not ended it all, he would have faced a hard life in prison due to his age and vulnerability. This story brings us to our next entry, The Angel of Death. Nah, they say he ended it all. That's crazy, man. Imagine being that young and just thinking of that violently to even just end your own. Like, it takes a Like, I'm not going to lie. Even after, like, blitzing a whole school, like, it still takes some balls to end your own life. I'm not going to lie. If you if you guys all remember that story about, where was it? Like, the, the guy that shot up the Tops Market, whatever it was. Like, I forgot. But, like, he was recording it. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, the Buffalo. I think it was Buffalo. I don't remember, bro. But he shot up somewhere. Like, he shot up some Tops or something. And he was trying to end his, sh but he couldn't. Like, he just couldn't. Like, it takes some nuts. So, like, a 12-year-old could do that and shoot up a whole school? Nah, bro. That kid has some stuff on his mind. Jeffrey Weiss. On March 21st, 2005, the community of Red Lake, Minnesota was forever changed when 16-year-old Jeffrey Weiss carried out one of the deadliest school shootings in American history at Red Lake High School. Weiss, who had struggled with tragedy and turmoil throughout his life, killed several people. Weiss's troubled upbringing included the loss of his father to suicide four years earlier and his mother to a car accident that left her with severe brain damage. He was raised by his grandfather, a tribal police officer, and his grandfather's girlfriend, whom he killed along with his and Did he just say that um his grand his his mom dying in a car accident and dad dying giving him brain damage? Is that is that how it works? I'm gonna replay that. Turmoil throughout his life killed several people. Wise's troubled upbringing included the loss of his father to suicide four years earlier and his mother to a car accident that left her oh. with severe brain damage. That can give you brain damage? I thought that would give you like you know what I'm saying maybe depression or some like psychological mental illness I guess but brain damage was raised by his grandfather a tribal police officer and his grandfather's girlfriend whom he killed along with his grandfather before heading to the school yo chat what y'all think bro like let's get some more comments in here like what y'all think y'all think you can get brain damage from um going through some of that tragic and trauma like traumatizing because I'm thinking about brain damages and like you know what I'm saying your brain whiplashes in your skull you crash you know what I'm saying car crash punched up in the head drop fell wrong way brain damage concussion I didn't know trauma could give you brain damage. What y'all think, bro? Get some chats. Wise had a history of disciplinary issues and was known for drawing skulls and swastikas, expressing admiration for Hitler and calling himself the Angel of Death. At the school, Weiser targeted students and staff 
killing and injuring many before engaging in a shootout with police. He eventually took his own life in a classroom. In total, Weiser killed nine people and wounded seven before taking his own life. The lives lost included his grandfather, his grandfather's girlfriend, a security guard, a teacher, and five students. Some believed death was a mercy for him compared to the mental and physical anguish he would have faced in prison had he lived. 100%. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. On April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, two seniors at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, carried out a devastating attack. They killed 13 people, injured 24 others, and then took their own lives by suicide. Harris, 18, and Klebold, 17, had planned the attack for over a year, using firearms, explosives, and incendiary devices. They targeted their peers and teachers, causing widespread destruction and chaos. The attack lasted approximately 49 minutes, ending with the pair's suicides in the library. For the families of the 13 who lost their lives, the pain and grief were unbearable. They struggled to come to terms with the senseless loss of their loved ones, and many turned to the legal system in search of justice. Mark Maines, the individual who sold a gun to Eric Harris and purchased ammunition for him, was sentenced to six years in prison for his role in enabling the tragedy. Philip Duran, who introduced Harris and Klebold to Manes, also faced prison time where they probably suffered unimaginable horrors. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold will forever be remembered as mass murderers, just like our next entry who killed 32 people i was gonna say bro i feel like the columbine school shooting was like the mark of like school shooting i feel like if there was like a school shooting like like icon quote unquote not really like something to be glorified but like the opposite like you know that famous and infamous like there was like the infamous version of icon i feel like that's what columbine would be that's like what all the school shooters look up to like seung hui cho <laughs> Seung Hui Cho, a 23-year-old senior at Virginia Tech, carried out one of the most devastating mass shootings in modern American history on April 16, 2007. In a span of just a few hours, Cho took the lives of 32 people, injured 17 others, and forever scarred the community of Blacksburg, Virginia. The attack was meticulously planned and executed, with Cho targeting two specific locations on campus. He first killed two students in a dorm room, then moved on to a nearby classroom building where he took the lives of 30 more people. The police were able to identify Cho through fingerprints left on the weapons used in the attack. In the aftermath of the tragedy, a manifesto and videos sent by Cho to NBC News revealed the depth of his anger and resentment. Cho. His writing spoke of a desire for revenge against a world he felt had wronged him, and a need for infamy and notoriety. If Cho had survived the attack, he would have faced life in prison with- Nah, Cho look like the type of nigga to shit up at school, bro. Look at this kid, bro. <laughs> Yo, what are you doing, cuz? No, Cho. Not Cho, bro. Without parole. Instead, Cho took his own life as the police closed in, leaving behind a trail of devastation and heartbreak that would be felt for years to come. Adam Lanza. Adam Lanza, 20, carried out the tragic Damn, Sandy bro. Hook Elementary School shooting on December 14, 2012 in Newtown, Connecticut. He fatally shot 20 children and six adult staff members before taking his own life. Prior to the school shooting, Lanza killed his mother, Nancy Lanza, at their home. He then took her legally purchased firearms, including a Bushmaster XM-15 E2S rifle, and went to the school, where he carried out the devastating attack. Lanza's actions that day were the culmination of a complex and troubled history. He had struggled with mental health issues, including anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder, and had become increasingly withdrawn and isolated in the years leading up to the shooting. Lanza's motives for the shooting remain unclear, but it is evident that his struggles with mental health and his obsession with violence ultimately led to the tragic events at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The act was especially gruesome because 20 of his victims were below seven years. If he hadn't taken his life, other inmates would probably have killed him in prison, seeking justice for those he murdered in cold blood. Christopher Harper Mercer Christopher Harper Mercer was responsible for the tragic shooting at Umpqua Community College in Roseburg, Oregon on October 1st, 2015. He killed nine people and injured eight others before taking his own life as police arrived. The incident was one of the deadliest mass shootings in modern American history. Harper Mercer, 26, was a student at the college and had a history of mental health issues and a fascination with mass shootings. He was armed with multiple firearms, which he had legally purchased, and wore a flak jacket. During the attack, he targeted a classroom in the Snyder Hall building 
building, where he shot and killed several students and the teacher. The shooting started at 10.38 a.m. PDT, and the first police response was at 10.44 a.m., six minutes after the first 911 call was received. The incident lasted for a few minutes, ending with Harper Mercer taking his own life as police arrived. The victims were shot in a classroom in Snyder Hall. Investigations revealed that Harper Mercer had a troubled history, with a fascination with violence and mass shootings. He had studied mass killings and had viewed videos of killings online. He had also oh, no. been hospitalized for psychiatric issues and had been prescribed medication. These made his preferred weapon for violence a gun, just like our next killer, Salvador Ramos. On May 24, 2022, a devastating mass shooting occurred at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. Salvador Ramos, an 18-year-old former student, carried out the attack, resulting in the tragic loss of 21 lives. Ramos, who had a history of being bullied and struggled with a speech impediment, had become increasingly fascinated with school shootings and sought notoriety on social media. His online behavior had raised concerns among his peers, with some even nicknaming him School Shooter. On the day of the shooting, Ramos so arrived at the school ironic. around 11.30 a.m., armed with a semi-automatic rifle and wearing body armor. He entered the school through an unlocked door and made his way to a classroom. Yo, I love the fact that he's just casually scrolling through the school with a gun, bro. No one in sight, he's just like, nah, nah, nah. The day of the Look shooting, out. Ramos arrived at the school just around 11.30 a.m., armed with a semi- Like, no sense of urgency, no, like, nothing, no, like, wow, I'm really in this bitch shooting this shit up. Nah, he's just like, I'm chilling. Shooter. On the day of the bro. shooting, like, just Ramos look at, just look at how he's walking, arrived at the bro. school around 11.30 a.m. armed with <laughs> like, a semi-automatic rifle and wearing body armor. He entered the school through an unlocked door and made his way to a classroom, where he began shooting. The victims included 19 students, aged 9, 11, and two teachers, Eva Mireles and Irma Garcia. The shooting lasted for approximately 45 minutes before Ramos was fatally shot by a Border Patrol agent. The agent, who was off duty and in the area, responded to the scene and engaged Ramos, ending the attack. Perhaps Ramos was saved from unimaginable prison horror when he was shot. Thanks for watching. Check out the Nah, he definitely was, bro. I would 100% say he definitely was. What's crazy to me is like, I remember watching that whole um, they, they released footage of the police in like the corner, just like just hold, like camping. Like, they're just holding like a fort down, just a bunch of cops no urgency. Everyone that day was just chilling. Like, that dude was chilling, walking into school hurting kids. And the cops were chilling, trying to arrest him. Like, everyone was just chilling. Like, I don't know what was going on with them. That's crazy. Thank you all for watching this.